um, just ask uh, something about assessment. Um, and before I go to assessment, I would like your, your honest uh, um, assessment of the psychosocial impact of this current situation on our students. What is your observation? Um, <clears throat> is it, how is it affecting our students? There's something Yandi say that just by having a smaller classroom, there's a sense of quietness in class. Do you think that the quietness is because we are few so we are not making noise? Or do you think the quietness, Yandi, is because there's this new normal we are trying to grapple with and maybe I can't see my next friend or there's just um, a continuous worry on the student's head also about issues around risks for infection. What has been your observation because you've been around for three weeks? Yandi. <clears throat> Um, I think it's a mixture of both. So I think they're quiet because they don't have their friends. But I do have um, one of my original. So my classes have been split, I think, into my, I think three classes have been split into six. So there's one class that's remained very boisterous, very expressive and, you know, very active. But the others are very quiet. And I do think it has something to do with uh, not seeing friends, but also because um, I teach them history and, you know, we have to speak about, you know, links of the past to the present. They are very, they are very worried. Um, we've spoken, I think, a number of times now, and it, key, it will come up, I think, almost on a daily basis that, you know, they are not happy with the government's response. Um, we are, the teachers are obviously not happy and they keep asking, you know, are we safe? Are we safe? And, um, my answer to them is always, we are not safe, but there is, you know, nothing we can do. The policy, the people who make the laws in the country have decided that we must be here. So we are here. What we can do, and I, you know, we have to, you know, remind them about COVID safety protocols and all those things. And it must be that we, I remind them, and I, I hope other teachers, I'm sure they do as well, is that we have to do what we can, because that is all we can. So I do see like um, a sense of anxiety from them as well, and kind of, you know, I don't know, it's like you can touch and feel the tension and the trepidation, all those things in them. And it's a bit disheartening. Um, I think I was, you know, sad for them the first two weeks. I was like, I, you know, it really, really just kind of takes um, that out of me. It really just makes me a bit sad for them more than I will ever be for myself, that they are here and they don't really understand why they're here. But because I guess of the subject I teach, we are able to speak about um, government responses. And I think, I'm hoping they're becoming more critical. And that's all I've ever wanted. <laughs> more critical thinking as a teacher. That's all I've ever wanted from them. And I'm a bit glad, I'm glad to see it, but definitely not under these circumstances, I guess. Okay, great. So I think I'm just pointing out that as we go back, uh, sometimes as teachers, when we go to school, I mean, there's always this pressure of it's teaching and there's content to cover. There's an exam that is coming up and we need to revise for this exam. And we might just want to go straight into, you know, have you mastered this and have you mastered this? But I think what is coming out from your, from your, from your submissions is that we need to be a little conscious that the kids are also in the midst of this challenge. They know, they hear what is going on around. They hear, especially when there is a confusion at the leadership level and that burden rests on them. They have the capacity and they actually worry. So they could be carrying the worry about um, being infected or they could, I mean, I mean, not being safe and catching coronavirus, or they could be carrying the worry of the economic burden um, that somebody's, Am I better now, Sandra? Yeah, there is a, there's a bit of a wave in your voice. I don't know if I'm the only one hearing it. Um, can I be heard now? Rebecca? It's still the same. It's, it's uh, like like some white noisy Yeah, noise. there's a feedback. 
mm. some feedback. I guess somebody's doing something in the neighborhood. I'll try to just um, keep it going. So anyway, so I think that consciousness that, um, that our children are also coming with psychological burden and being sensitive for, to that. And I think being honest, so Yandi says she's been very honest, but then she's also then kind of empowered them to make them see there is a role you could play to do the best to keep yourself as safe as possible. And one of the things that you've talked about that's also very important is how we do not just run away to the curriculum and disconnect from the reality. That the more we can try to teach the curriculum while being sensitive to the reality and feeding in some of these concerns in exploring the concept of what you're teaching, then it might be helpful. Rebecca, how is the sense of the psychosocial reality amongst your children? They're younger, but what have you observed? Well, I've observed that um, as part of uh, their way of dealing with anxiety, some of them are actually living in denial. Some actually don't believe that there is COVID in Ghana. I spoke to them and some told me that they know there is COVID, but it's not in Ghana. And others, others are just oblivious about whatever is happening around them. They just don't care. And the few who care are also anxious. They are very afraid. Much as myself, myself, I'm afraid sometimes, but you know, as a teacher, I have to bottle up all my fears and then help my students, assist them. But I also realized that um, this COVID has taught us to be very dynamic. In a twinkle of an eye, everybody is turning into a computer literate and you have to make a good use of the computer in our studies. And um, it has also brought the loopholes in our system. We have seen where we have to seal up. And we've also come to realize that precedence should be given to um, vocational and technical knowledge than whatever we are doing. Because some are actually saying, what if we forgo the exam? Or, I mean, even if we write the exam, where are we taking the certificates to? Because everywhere is choked up. The virus is everywhere. Nothing seems to be going on at the moment. But in all in all, we are just managing. The, the, the psychosocial effect is great. Psychologically, people aren't stable. But we are just trying to help the students build up, just identify with the situation and live with it. Because that is, as we say, the new normal. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you uh, Rebecca. So you're confirming that, we, I mean, there are people who are dealing with it by denying and just trying to say, I don't care, I don't think it's around, and therefore kind of creating a mental block to that. And uh, we need to be conscious about that and hopefully see how to bring them to unblock that because until they unblock it they're not going to deal with it and then they might then get careless as you see and the extra burden of a teacher having to carry that weight with him or her and see how to support the students around that and of course what you're talking about um, the gaps that this is exposing but also the opportunity to sharpen our dynamism that we have to learn on the go and we have to respond to the issues as they come and the resilience, the African resilience that we talk about, that we keep pushing, we keep working, and we keep hoping that things will change. Um, but I guess what you're saying, though, is that the people who are making decisions have to be conscious about these things and have to demonstrate that we are learning the lessons and we might be taking notes to do things differently. Sandra, how are the young ones taking this? They can't talk to each other. They can't play with their dolls. They can't go to their reading corner. They can't uh, share their food or uh, the excitement of uh, play with each other. What's your observation of what's going on with, uh, with the young ones? And how are you helping them deal with it? 
Okay, uh, yeah, this has been quite a challenge because, you know, kids at this age, uh, they learn with play. They just want to play. You know, that's, uh, that's how they learn the most. But uh, in, in our case, what I, what, what I did um, at the beginning of our online learning, I introduced what I call the, uh, a journal for them. Uh, where they get to express their personal views and their knowledge, where I get to send in two or three questions a week, and they have to honestly uh, respond to that and write it down in their, in their journals. So I call this journal My Journey During COVID-19. So this is whereby I ask them, uh, what is COVID-19? That's how we started. What do you think it means? Uh, Okay, so this is what you know about it, but how do you feel about it? What does it mean to you? You know, what, what do you wish could change or what do you think is expected of us? And I ask them questions like, so how do you spend your time now? Or how do you feel that you're, you're, we're doing this, these things differently now? So this has actually allowed me to tap into their, their innermost parts and um, get to understand how they're feeling psychological. Um, I'll share one experience. One of the kids uh, expressed, uh, one of the kids in my class expressed that he feels uh, COVID makes, makes her feel like she's in prison uh, because she cannot see her friends. Even at home, her mom is not allowing her to, to play with her neighbors or even to go outside. Every time she would go outside, she gets a scolding because I think that is due to the fear around COVID-19 that the, the parents are also trying their best you know, um, with the information that they have because people are just an an anxious, you know. So she was expressing, uh, teacher, I miss you. Uh, my mom is not teaching me the way that you do. And sometimes I don't understand. And if I try to explain, she doesn't also understand me, which is the struggle because now parents um, are required uh, to, to get involved on a daily basis with, with their, their kids' work. You know, there's no way you can shut yourself uh, out. It's no longer the teacher's job to make sure the child gets the maximum uh, knowledge. Now, if you as a parent, you're not also active in the growth or in this journey of uh, education for your child, it's, it's you shooting yourself on your leg because uh, at the end of the day, it's, you know, usually it's some parents have a, a perspective that teaching is for teachers, you know, send your child to school, they learn what they learn, they don't come with your work here at home. But now they have no choice because these kids are spending 90% of the time with them. So now this journal is helping. I made it specifically for myself and the parents so that the parents also get to understand because I think especially as in the African context, uh, a, a lot of parents uh, don't have time to sit down and find out how a child feels about certain things because they think COVID-19 is dangerous. They don't want to hear how a child feels or what they want to do. They just want to tell a child, you're not going outside, you're not supposed to play, you're not, it's, it's, it's a no, 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 no. It's only red flags coming from their side. And kids uh, are misinterpreting their care and their concern to punishment, uh, imprisonment, so now you find some parents calling in, please talk to my child, he doesn't understand because the child will tell you, where are you getting the work that you're giving me? My teacher didn't say that. So now as a parent, you have to call in or send a message to say, no, baby, I'm the one who gave mommy the information to give you. Please listen to mommy and do uh, follow the instruction that I've sent through. So really, it's, 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 it's a transition. It's sad, but unfortunately, this is the new thing that we all have to uh, quickly get ourselves accustomed to. Like what Rebecca said, that everyone is becoming a computer genius. Everyone is forced to be technologically savvy because this is the, the new way of learning. There are a lot of uh, social platforms, uh, a lot of uh, platforms that it is offering a lot of parents. I mean, now, I think education is more broad now. There is no limit all of us are given access. It's unfortunate uh, for the underprivileged that don't have the resources, but if you look at other websites, they've opened up free education in Africa where, whereby they offer classes, whereby they offer free storybooks, free story time, and all the necessary resources that we didn't have access to or we had to pay for 
to get access to. So it's, it's quite exciting. And I think we as uh, teachers at large, uh, as educators, we need to come to a point whereby we become more involved, not only being concerned about making a child learn and understand maths, or making a child learn and understand history, but also uh, being concerned about their psycholo psychological well-being, you know, to make sure that it's different. But I'm going to interrupt you, sorry for that, but uh, just keeping my eye on time, and I can see we have three people who want to ask questions, and perhaps we can connect with uh, some of the things you're here to say. But just not to lose out on track on some of the things that you say, which is really important. That opportunity, the, the innovation about a journal, and I know that in, in, in our public schools, given the numbers, it may not be possible to, to read some on every child's journal. But I guess the, the bigger innovation or solution there is creating opportunity for reflection. So within the, within the time for interaction with the students, it could be that the student knows that once every week, we'll have 20 minutes or five minutes in my le in lesson of uh, Chichayandi to just air our air our feelings and some of the burdens that you're carrying with us. I'm feeling like a prisoner. I'm having a problem with my parents. My, you know, the fear that I'm having. And so I think that relation is also very important. That this is going to push us, if we follow this track, to be more relational and to create time and for them to feel and to know that you understand they are also carrying some weights with them. So I think that's really, really important. And we need to ask ourselves, what opportunity this presents for engaging parents more? But how do we make that happen? And of course, the engagement is going to vary. Some of them might not teach, that's for sure. But what opportunities still exist to now make these parents a little more part of the learning conversation? And there's something Yandi said, and perhaps Sandra and Rebecca said, it means the way we are going to teach, if we are going to support this with any form of online or remote teaching, then the way we do those, those teaching must be such, in such a way that parents or whoever is at home can jump into that conversation. We must make it less textbook oriented and more application or, or somehow connected that anybody around that child could jump into that conversation with that child and still promote uh, conversation or thinking around some of those things.